My family loves knock-knock jokes, and this very morning, my husband came up with one for me to use in this sermon. So we're going to start with a knock-knock joke. Knock-knock. Jonah. Jonah me on this amazing adventure. It's going to be a whale of a time. (laughs) Credit to my husband, Emil. All right, uh, with that, let's say another prayer. Heavenly Father, you are so good and merciful, and I ask that your mercy pour forth um, from this message today. I ask that you just take the little bits and pieces of my experience, the the words, the ideas, the images, and use them to show how good you are. Thank you, Jesus. In your name, amen. How many of you have read the book of Jonah? Just show me, show me hands. Most people, how many of you are familiar with the book, even if you haven't read it? Okay. So Jonah is a short book, definitely worth your time reading. We will walk through it today. Um, but this is actually one of my favorite books in the Bible. And today I want us to read through it, to walk through it. And I want us to do so putting on our literary hats. And we're going to think about this book through the lens of satire. Does everyone know what satire is? Probably, even if you couldn't give me a dictionary definition, you could probably point to something that's satire. So let's get an example. What would be an example of satire? CNN. CNN. (laughs) Not what I was expecting. I was expecting maybe SNL, Saturday Night Live. <laughs> that, that would be an example of kind of our light satire, right, where we're using humor to poke at political figures, celebrities, just to kind of make fun of those leaders. We also have um, a, a darker kind of satire, um, which actually, hold on, let me, let me just start here. So satire is going to use tools like irony, it also uses humor, hyperbole or exaggeration, um, sarcasm, stereotypes, and its aim is to expose and ridicule the follies of human nature. So we have light satire like SNL, but we also have darker satire. Has anybody heard of Jonathan Swift? 18th century Irish, thank you, Emil, (laughs) Irish writer. Um, He wrote Gulliver's Travels, maybe you've heard of that title. Um, He also wrote A Modest Proposal, which is a work of satire. And in that work, he proposes um, that in order to solve the the poverty in Ireland, um, that the poor Irish people sell their children to the rich as food, right? So this is not his true, honest solution to the problem of poverty, but he's trying to um, point out the um, attitudes that pe- the elite had toward the poor um, and trying to expose and ridicule the, the heart, the, the, the cruel heart of those attitudes um, with this use of satire. Okay, so satire, um, it, it is verbal art, it is visual, it's used in visual art, also dramatic art, um, and it's a lot of fun because from the outside, we get to laugh really, really hard at at the ridiculousness of human nature. Now, I said that uh, satire uses irony. We have probably all said at least once in our lives, oh, that's ironic, right? What we mean by that um, is that someone said or did something that did not go the way we expected it to go. In fact, it's actually quite contrary to the expectation that we had. So if you are married, or if you're a parent, you live in the world of irony all the time. uh, Because you're constantly realizing that while you have an expectation for something, um, things never go as you expected, or you yourself constantly depart from those expectations. Just this very morning, as we were getting into the car, um, my husband told my four-year-old, okay, you need to go to your car seat. And she's trying to tell him something, and she can't walk and talk. And so I said, you know, Elspeth, you can walk and talk at the same time. To which my husband looked at me, 
because I am the master of not being able to do anything while I'm talking. So the expectation here is, right, okay, that Vanessa cannot do that, yet she thinks her daughter can and is, in fact, instructing her daughter to do the very thing that I cannot do. Irony, right? Okay, so these, the, 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 the art of satire, which draws on irony, um, this is how I want us to think about the book of Jonah. Now, I do want to say that by proposing that Jonah, to some degree, um, uses these tools in order to highlight the folly of human nature. I'm not trying to suggest that it is not true or even not historically accurate. There, there are scholarly debates, biblical scholars debate about the historical reliability of the book of Jonah. Um, I think that there's compelling evidence on both sides that's worth considering, but that's not really where I want to go because ultimately in that conversation, everybody agrees that this book is packed full of theological truths. And that's really what I want to get at. But I do just want to say that just because we're looking at it as satire doesn't mean that it isn't historically accurate. Um, at least in, in some ways. I'm not so sure about the big fish. But God can do many things. Okay. So as we get into the book of Jonah, if you have your Bibles with you, now is the time to open it to Jonah. If you have your phone and you use an app, you can do that, although I've said before that the Holy Spirit is less likely to speak to you when you're using the Bible on your phone, but hey, to each their own. Okay, so when we open up the book of Jonah, we start off like this. <clears throat> now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. We're going to pause there. If, we won't do this, but if you were to just put your finger right here in the book of Jonah, and you were to flip through the minor prophets, this is what you would find, that most of them follow a very similar pattern. The word of the Lord, or the burden of God, came to name of prophet. And then the rest of that book is the prophet speaking to that people or that nation, the word of the Lord, right? Okay, back to Jonah. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Okay, so right off at the very start, the, the writer of this book is um, knowingly, I, I think, knowingly sort of poking at a pattern that we have established here, right? The word of, the God comes, word of God comes to the prophet. The prophet does what God says. That is what prophets are to do, right? But then there's Jonah. And Jonah does not do what God says. In fact, he does quite the contrary. He runs. He tries to run from the presence of the Lord. Now, who can even accomplish that? But then there's Jonah, who thinks that might be possible. Okay, so we've got to just pause here real quick as we get started, because we need to understand something about Nineveh, right? Does anyone know what empire Nineveh was the capital of? Okay, Assyria. Okay, Nineveh was the capital of the Neo-Assyrian Empire. Do we like empires, generally speaking? No, I mean, they're usually pretty brutal, and they use, um, they use different tactics to exert power that are usually detrimental to the human spirit. Um, so let's just get a really quick glimpse of how God feels about Nineveh. Okay, this is fun. So let's jump over, still in the Minor Prophets, to Nahum, a couple um, prophets forward. Okay, this is from chapter 3. I'm reading, starting in verse 5. Behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will lift your skirts over your face. I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. I will cast abominable filth upon you, make you vile, and make you a spectacle. It shall come to pass that all who look upon you will flee from you and say, Nineveh is laid waste. Who will bemoan her? Folks, God does not delight in Nineveh. Hence the reason why God is like Jonah. I need you to go to Nineveh. Because I need you to tell them that 
what was it? That um, their wickedness has come up before me. Okay, so let's also just point out, now I don't know for sure when the book of Jonah was written. It may have been before or after the Assyrian Empire sacked the northern kingdom of Israel and took the ten tribes that were there and uh, deported them because that was a common strategy that the Assyrian Empire used. They were actually a brilliant empire in many ways. Um, They would um, attack um, a a kingdom um, and then they would take the locals and they would redistribute them in the empire to break up that local allegiance Um, and to basically just assimilate them into empire identity. So this happened to Israel, um, to to the northern kingdom, not to Judah. Um, And, you know, to what extent this is taking place um, before the book of Jonah was written, you know, it's very possible. So it could be that Jonah's like, okay, like my task here is to go to um, the capital city of an empire who has, like, demolished part of my kingdom, right? Um, But even if that wasn't the case, the Assyrian Empire was brutal. So they were not afraid to use tactics, um, scare tactics, where they would um, impale their victims. Um, There's even a description of them decapitating their their victims' heads and putting them around their necks as necklaces. Um, They were uh, people who, again, used tactics that were terrifying and um, that, that crushed the human spirit. And, and again, God is saying, go to Nineveh, to this capital city, the seat of this empire, and tell them that they're wicked. Okay, now, and I mean, you, you can probably imagine some of the feelings that Jonah might have. And you can probably appreciate the fact that Jonah's like, I'm out of here. I'm going to Tarshish. <laughs> no one really knows where that is, but that's where I'm going. Okay, so, so that's a little bit of the context here that we're working with. Now let's, let's just jump in because this book is so good. So we've got Jonah. He's trying to go to Tarshish. He has to get on a ship, right? So he boards the ship and sets off to Tarshish. And a great storm comes upon the ship. The sailors which by the way, sailors, generally speaking, are some of the most like um, superstitious people because they work on ships. Like you can't control the weather, right? So, I mean, these are like very pagan people who are, you see the storm and they're doing everything they can to like make the ship like keep going. And then they're praying to their gods and they are scared. And then there's Jonah. What is Jonah doing? He's down in the bottom part of the ship, sleeping. Yeah, so one of the, the captain comes to him and he wakes him up and he says, dude, please pray to your God so we don't die. And eventually the sailors decide to cast lots because they're like, this storm, like there's something fishy going on here. So they cast lots to see who is to, to blame and the lot falls on Jonah. And they say, please tell us, for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country, and of what people are you? And Jonah tells them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Do you believe him? I mean, okay, he fears the Lord, the the one who made the, the sea and the dry land, right? But he's also running from the Lord. So let's just note that there's a little bit of a, you know, there's some, there's some irony here. Um, Jonah might say something, but really his actions are showing us quite the contrary. But the sailors, they hear this, and they are exceedingly afraid. They're like, why have you done this? Because Jonah told them that he's running from God. So they're like, why have you done this? What are you thinking? And so they ask him, what do, what do we need to do? to make the sea calm. Well, Jonah says, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you, for I know that this great tempest is because of me. Let's pause right there. Do you think God wants Jonah to be thrown over the boat? Like, is that the solution to the problem here? Not at all. I mean, what does God want? 
Go to another, like, just like, hey, admit you're wrong here, Jonah. <laughs> I asked you to do something. Can you do it? And Jonah is like, please kill me. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to have that confrontation with God, right? And so he tells the sailors to throw him overboard. But the, those pagan sailors, those superstitious pagan sailors are like, no, we can't do that. So they continue to try everything they can. And then as a last resort, they agree to throw him over. And what do they do as they throw him over? They pray to God that that death would not be upon them because they have some kind of respect here that Jonah doesn't have. So they pick Jonah up, they throw him overboard, and the sea calms. <clears throat> Then the men, the sailors, feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Guys, that is amazing, right? That is not what we're expecting here. We've got the prophet who's like, just kill me. I don't want to face God. And then those pagan sailors, they're like, oh, this God who is the God who made the heavens and the sea, we understand something about this God, and we worship him. We will make vows to this God. And then there's Jonah sinking, and God prepares a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah is in the belly of that fish for three days and three nights. And he writes beautiful Hebrew poetry. <clears throat> Um, at some point in that three days and three nights, he has some kind of deep spiritual experience. And we get um, this prayer. I won't read through the whole thing, although it's certainly worth reading through. But, um, but Jonah recognizes that he was cast into the deep of the sea and he is being swallowed up, right? And he remembers to look toward the holy temple of the Lord and to call out to God, who saves him. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. And then Jonah says, those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice to you. With the voice of thanksgiving, I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. God hears that. And he gets the fish to spit Jonah up onto dry land. And the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. Okay, this time Jonah does as we would expect. He goes to Nineveh, and he enters into the city, and he begins to preach what is probably the most successful sermon ever. He says, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Probably not the message that most of us would repent to. Frankly, if I heard that, I would, I don't know. I don't think that that would cause me to repent. But all of Nineveh falls to its knees and repents. This is, again, amazing and not what we would expect because this is Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrian Empire. And here comes this prophet um, who says, y'all are going to die in 40 days. And so it says, the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. And that means from the king who, who issues a decree and who says everybody needs to put on sackcloth and repent and fast. Um, all the way down to the beasts of Nineveh, right? The cattle, the horses, like, I mean, that's quite a spread. We've got, we've got the beasts repenting here, guys. And they don't even know for sure if God will be merciful toward them, right? The king says, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Right? They're going out on a limb here, repenting, because they see something true about this God that Jonah supposedly fears. And when God sees this, he does relent. He has compassion. And then there's Jonah. 
This is the start of chapter four. But Jonah, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. And so he prayed to God, and he says, all right, God, <clears throat> was this not what I said when I was still in my country, right? This is why I ran away to Tarshish, because I know that you are a gracious and merciful God. You're slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. This is straight out of Exodus, right? This is the revelation that God gives to Moses when Moses asks to see God face to face. This is God. And Jonah knows it up here, right? And because Jonah knows it up here, he knows, like, the likelihood of this whole mission that God has sent me on is not going to go the way I want it to go. Um, I don't like these Ninevites, and I don't want God to have compassion on them. And thus, the trip to Tarshish. And again, we see Jonah saying that he would rather die than to allow that revelation of God to permeate his heart. All right, he says, Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And God asks, Is it right for you to be angry? Okay. Simple question. Right? God's just trying to, trying to connect with Jonah here. And God sees that he's not going to get anywhere. I had a, a student describe Jonah as throwing a big pity party. Um, and I think that's pretty accurate. <laughs> so Jonah goes out of the city. He, he sets up a tent because he wants to just sit and watch what is going to happen to Nineveh. And as he is sitting out in the hot sun, God prepares a plant. And that plant grows up, it's a big plant, grows up over, over, Noah, or over Noah, Jonah, and gives him shade. And Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But as morning dawned the next day, God prepared a worm, and it so damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a strong east wind, and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and said, once again, it is better for me to die than to live. All right. Jonah is clearly not in a place where he's able to reason with God, right? We know that as humans, we have a high capacity um, to reason. And we also know that we have a very low capacity to tantrum um, or to just sort of melt um, with strong emotions. I say this as a parent, so I've seen this, and I know it's true for adults too. Um, and Jonah is here, right? He, he's, not at, he's not operating at this level of being able to reason. Now, to, to get to that place of being able to use that higher faculty of reason, we have to feel a sense of safety and connection, right? So I just want you to observe how God is responding to Jonah. God is trying carefully to connect with Jonah in a way that's going to meet Jonah where he's at, right? God says, okay, I see. I see you're having a moment, okay? Let, let me offer you something so that we can maybe get to that, that higher place. Um, but still, Jonah is so strung out in his strong feelings that he can't meet God there. But once again, God asks him, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? right? We know that it's not really about the plant. It's about something else. But the plant triggers the thing that Jonah is struggling with. So God asks, is it right for you to be angry? Once again, Jonah says, it is right for me to be angry, even to death. And then the Lord said, you have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored, nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh? That great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right and their left and much livestock. So God's saying, look, there are 120,000 people in Nineveh. 
they, they don't know right from wrong. But when they're shown a revelation of me, they repent, right? You, Jonah, you know right from wrong, right? You're a Hebrew, and you clearly know your Hebrew Bible, and yet you cannot see how I am trying to act, not only on the behalf of the people of Nineveh, but on your behalf, Jonah, because when you ran from me, when you would rather die than face me, I had mercy on you, and I saved you. In the belly of that fish, it might have been stinky, but here you are. And yet Jonah in his prayer, do you remember? He said, those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. Hmm, I don't know, Jonah. Those who hold fast to their own ideas and limit God, they forsake their own mercy. That's what we see with Jonah here. <clears throat> God shows Jonah mercy at every turn. God is inviting Jonah to lean into that mercy so the knowledge that he has of God in his head can permeate his heart. But folks, I want to propose to you that that might be the most challenging thing that we have to experience as humans. I don't think Jonah is alone in this. I think if we were to consider our hearts carefully, we would see that we too are Jonah. Now, God, I mean, sorry, Jesus actually talks about this, same, same irony, that where we are shown extreme mercy from God, we cannot then go and show that mercy to other people. Jesus talks about this in Matthew 18. You will probably remember the question that Peter asks him, uh, how often should I forgive my brother when he sins against me, right? Jesus says seven times seven, seven times 70 times. And then he tells this parable about the great king. Um, there's a king who wants to settle his accounts um, and he has a, a servant who owes him a huge debt. They bring the servant to him and the servant falls on his knees. He cannot pay it. And he and so the king is like, all right, well, we're going to have to sell you, your wife, and your children, and then we'll take that money and, and apply it toward paying the debt. And he falls on his knees and, knees and pleads, please just give me more time. I will pay the debt. I just need you to be patient. The king is moved with compassion. He doesn't just give him more time. He just forgives the whole debt. And so this servant, now freed from this debt, goes out. Is he redefined by this encounter with the king? No, not at all. He then goes out, finds someone, another servant, who owes him a small debt, grabs the guy by his throat, and demands payment for that small debt. When that man falls on his knees, pleading for more time, uh, the, the servant says no and sends him to jail. Now the king finds out about this. <clears throat> And he says, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? I don't think Jesus tells parables that only touch a few of us, right? Again, this is the struggle of being a human. And I want us to see that our default mode of operation, our default mode, right, our inner sinfulness and our fleshy nature, we want fairness. We want people to get what they deserve, as long as it's not us, right? There's that irony again. <clears throat> but we want a sense of fairness. And this doesn't always have to be about someone wronging us and, we, and us needing to forgive them, right? We just don't like somebody because they do something we don't like. And we think, well, that person just deserves, I don't know, badness, whatever. You know, like, I guess I, I don't want us to think about this just at this extreme of, like, they're our enemy. We have to forgive them. But it, it starts in a smaller place. Do we not like people because we're scared of them, because we're insecure? 
and they do something that, in, that threatens our sense of security, right? That's something I struggle with. And I see this message speaking to that level too. Okay, so, so our default mode of operation here is fairness, right? But Jesus shows us this, this irony that we live in, that we constantly live in, that where God shows us mercy, whether we see it or not, he shows us great mercy. But we then go, go to other people and we limit that mercy with them. We cannot comprehend God's mercy. I think that's really what it comes down to. Um, my, I gave my daughter a calculator um, because she wanted a phone. She's four, she's not getting a phone, so I gave her a calculator. And it's great, she gets to push all the buttons, you know, you get to pretend on it. But, you know, of course she's, she doesn't know how to use it, so she's pushing all the buttons, and then she's like, Mom, what does this say? Syntax error. That means that whatever you just entered in the calculator doesn't compute. It doesn't speak the language of the calculator, right? So it says syntax error. Well, she loved that, so we started, like, taking sentences and, like, making it gibberish. So instead of saying, like, the girl ran to the store, we say, store ran girl to the, and then we say, syntax error cannot compute. <laughs> I love it. Um, <laughs> okay, so this is God's mercy, though, right? We experience God's mercy. We cannot comprehend it. Our system says syntax error cannot compute. <laughs> Um, but here's the thing, guys, and I think that this is actually one of the most incredible revelations that I've had as a parent. So the, as a parent, the way that I respond to my child's misbehavior has the power to either heal that child or to further hurt that child. Okay, so my response as a parent literally helps to build the structure of my child's brain. That's intimidating. <laughs> In the same way that a child, when a baby is born, of course they've got brain structure, but it, it, it continues its development in relationship with the caregivers. In the same way, as created beings, I think that our brains can only develop to their highest capacity when we receive relational input from our creator, right? But oftentimes that relational input hits us, cannot compute syntax error, right? So we've got a little bit of a, um, an irony going on here. But I don't think that we need to be stuck there. <clears throat> so I want you, I want to invite you to think about your own heart, to ponder your heart, because you know where you limit God's love. Whether, again, that's because you're unwilling to forgive, or maybe it's even smaller. You just kind of like to be negative toward people that you don't like. But that negativity builds up. And I think it really has a strong impact on our ability to relate to God and to other people. So I want you to reflect on your heart. And I want you to notice where do you limit God's love in your heart? Because that place where you draw that line, where you make that limit, that is the place that God wants to invite you to experience his mercy. In the same way that God was trying to show Jonah by saving him with the whale, God is trying to show you mercy. So then you can be an open vessel that pours out his love and mercy to other people.